Okay, g'day folks. In this video, what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about species and what, what species actually means. Um, a lot of people probably haven't studied biology at a level which is going to teach them what species are. Most of us might have learned a little bit about it at school, um, and then some of us might pursue it later in life um, just as an interest. So this video is really for people that um, don't really know much about what a species is. And I also want to talk about the importance of putting a name on an animal that you've got. So you find something and uh, you want to put a name on it. So how important is that? So if you are quite familiar with species and quite familiar with the whole process of speciation and understand the naming aspect, this video probably isn't for you. Just to give you a heads up before you watch it all. So what we've got here is, um, this is out of Heterick and Shattuck's paper, which is a revision on Iridomyrmics. And I've chosen this one here, Iridomyrmics cupreus, sp.n, that means it's a new species in this paper. So prior to this paper being published, excuse me, this paper, this species was never um, known, it wasn't a published species. So when it becomes published, if it says sp.n, that means new species, it's now for the first time out there in the, the real big world for people to view and use as a name. Now what it says here, it says types, it says holotype worker. Now what that means is that this ant, which you can see here is found in sort of central South Australia, this ant, the species, is actually this animal in the photo. It's only that one single animal, this holotype. That is the species. So this species, this specimen, which is the species, is kept in a collection, usually in a museum. All right. Anything else that we find and we call this species is a best fit. In other words, we're saying that if we find an ant and we study the ant and we come to the conclusion that it fits this description of Iridomyrmix cupreus, then what we're saying is that we have an ant which best fits Iridomyrmix cupreus. Because Iridomyrmix cupreus, the actual species, is this single individual, the holotype, which is in a museum. Now in this case there are also, if you look along here, it says paratypes, six workers from William Creek, South Australia. And that means that there were probably seven specimens collected, let's say seven specimens, the six workers, the six paratypes, and the one single holotype. So out of these seven ants, the author, or the authors in this case, have chosen one of them to be a holotype, which is going to be the actual species, and the others, the paratypes, are extra ants they've collected that enable a bit of a broader description. Okay, but the actual species is a holotype, that individual one ant. And that's important to remember. So what that means is that anything that you find is a best fit. It's just simply that you're saying, okay, this looks to be the same as this particular animal. Um, and this animal Unless someone comes along and says, well, look, Eurydomyrmix cuprius is actually another species that was described earlier in history, earlier in time, okay, that would then collapse this species within, um, it, would be, it would become a synonym. In other words, it would become the prior described species. And that happens. That happens quite frequently. When somebody finds an animal, they describe it. And then another taxonomist comes along and says, mm, no, this is, this is actually the same as an earlier described species. That can happen. But until such time that that happens, this is the official designation of this particular ant. And it was found in that location. Now, that doesn't mean to say that this same species won't be found in Western Australia 
or Northern Territory or Central Queensland or wherever. It could be. The further you get away from here, from this original location, the more likely the ant is going to change its morphology because its genetics become further separated from a distance point of view, from a real distance point of view. And so the genetics can also become separated to the point where there might be different colours, they might be different sizes, um, behaviour might be slightly different. And that's where taxonomy comes in to decide where the cutoff is for a new species. So I wanted to talk about this because a lot of people, um, that especially that are not um, well versed in species, uh, will hop on the internet, they'll go into Google and they try to find something that looks like their animal so they can give it a name. And that's understandable. I would have done the same thing if I hadn't studied um, biology, if I hadn't, if I didn't know what species are, are about, I would more than likely do the same thing. And I still do because it gives me a head start, but I only use it as a head start. Um, working out what a species is is a far more complex problem that is beyond this video. Now I wanted to look at, let's look at Bicknelli. I've already had a search for that. Bicknelli. Images. So I've found Bicknelli in this Iridomimics revision. The reason I want to talk about Bicknelli is that I often see photographs um, on Facebook, social media, of these small small ants and uh, they often get labelled as Iridomimix bicknelli. So what tends to happen is that people seek something that looks like what they've got and they'll find whatever's out there. Now there may be lots and lots of species but very few of them have actually been photographed well, especially alive, um, identified and photographed and published as live animals. Because even in here, if you look at these, these are all dead animals. And they're pretty good photos, isn't it? In fact, these are very good photos. But um, not many people, of course, identify ants. It's not exactly easy. And you've got to have a microscope, and you've got to spend the time and put in the effort to actually learn the terminology and learn all the words, what all the words mean, and really practice it, because it does take practice. So they find a photo in a book, um, or... It could be a photograph um, on the Atlas of Living Australia or something like that of a species which has been photographed. And they say, oh, look, it looks like that. And what they'll do is they'll put that name on it and then they'll publish it on the internet, of course. Then when other people search, and it'll, their picture may come up in Google Images um, with that name of that species. So it sort of gets spread. So it could be incorrect and that incorrect name then gets spread and it becomes just a, a falsity which is common right throughout the online environment. Um, so really it's best to try and avoid that if you can. Um, so with Bicknelli, I, I don't know where the origin is for that. I haven't really bothered to look to, to find out where the origin comes from. It is a very common ant, there's no doubt about that as it discusses in this paper. Now, in this paper, they talk about, the authors talk about a worker description. So if you wanted to identify this animal and you had a microscope, clearly you would work through the worker description. You would work through every aspect of it and figure out whether your animal fits it. Because it'll, once again, you're doing a best fit. Your animal, you're looking for a best fit. And you would really want to go through, not just Bicknella, of course, but everything, all the ants that might be slightly like it. That's what I always do. It takes, it can take hours to actually narrow down a species by the time you eliminate, because it's really a process of elimination. You're trying to eliminate all the ones where there are, where there are distinctive things which are, which are incorrect, which don't fit your animal. Now, if we go down here, let's have a look where he says, I want to have a look at how at the things that he says, here it is here, 
that make it stand out. So if we go to this line here, it says workers can be distinguished from similar greyish black ants by the lack of erect CT on the antennal skates and tibiae, or the tibia on the legs. Okay, so that's a very good characteristic because it says by the lack of erect CT. Now that means that you're looking for the absence of a character. So that's really good because the character's either there or it isn't. There's no grey area. Uh, now that's not like some of the other characters here. So let's keep reading. Now it also says next, it says they're elongate and rather narrow head capsule. Now this is, the, this is a comparative term or a comparative description I should say. So elongate. What does elongate mean? Long. But that's a comparative term. You've got to have something which is a standard before you can recognize what elongate means or shortened. Um, so that's that's a comparative term. And rather, 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 rather. What does rather mean? Hmm. A fair bit. <laughs> a rather narrow head capsule. Rather and narrow. Narrow is also, I mean, what does that actually mean? Um, that normally, normally, that means that we've got abnormal situations as well. Has a more or less, more or less. So we have all these descriptive words which are simply imprecise. They don't tell us exactly what we need to look for. Is the character there or is it not there? And that happens a lot in invertebrates. It happens a lot. There are very often very few characters which are really black and white. So what you're looking for is a collection of characteristics. You've got to look for a collection, not just like one characteristic usually. But I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so um, now the next one, the short bristly CT on the mesosomal gastral dorsum. That's good. So you're looking for short bristly CT. If they're there, good. If they're not, mm, okay, I probably don't have big nail eye. Bluish or greenish yellow. So once again, we're looking at bluish or greenish yellow. That's a color variation. So that's not comparative, but it's, it's a very variable characteristic. Okay, and then it just goes on about um, the fact that there could be lots of species within the group. It's really a complex, more of a species complex. Um, and no doubt it is looking at it because it's, it's really found Australia-wide. And when you get an animal that's found in so many different environments, the chances are that it's genetically um, isolated enough in particular areas that it'll be a different species. But once again, that's, that's down the track at the moment. Bicknell eye is based on this description. The next one I wanted to look at, which is in contrast to this. So Bicknell eye is complex. That's really what I was aiming at with that. Okay, so in contrast to Eridomimix Bicknell eye, I'm going to look at Campylotus consabrinus. And the reason for that is that Bicknell eye is a complex animal or difficult animal to identify because of its its tiny size. And the characters you're looking for are actually fairly difficult to see. They're not overly straightforward. But really it's the size. Three millimeter ant, and then you're going to need a good microscope and you're going to look very, very carefully. You need good light as well to be able to see the characters. Now Campanotus consabrinus is a much, much, much larger ant and has a very distinctive gaster, as we can see in this photograph with this, this light colored band at the front and the rest of the abdomen being dark. What we have here is the original description of Campanotus consabrinus. This was described firstly in 1842 by Ericsson and it was called Formica consabrina. And what you're seeing here is the entire description. I cut it off after the end of the description. Um, and this description I got from the Bioheritage Diversity Library. 
VHL by Biodiversity Heritage Library. Uh, you can get it on it's online and they have a lot of the old papers. It's a brilliant resource. And it's in Latin and it's of a queen. So you can see a holotype uh, queen that was from Tasmania and the holotype is now housed in a museum in Berlin. And of course subsequent to this researchers have looked at this animal, they've, they've found the animal in the wild, they've found um, uh, specimens in museums and they can clearly link the workers to the animal, to this queen, as a best fit. Of course it always comes back to best fit. Here we have uh, Clark, Australian Mimicologist, 1934. And here he's refuting Camponotus dimidiatus, dimidiatus, uh, described by Roger. He's saying that dimidiatus is in fact Camponotus consubrinus. So he says, this commonly and widely distributed species, he's referring to consubrinus, was found, found at, at Gellibrand, which is, I assume it's in Tasmania. Having examined many large series of all forms of this species from all parts of Tasmania and the mainland, I can find nothing in which to justify the retention um, for Roger's name, uh, Diomediatus. The differences in the Clypeus and the size mentioned by Roger um, are found in all the series that Clark looked at for, of, of Consulbrinus from Tasmania. He doesn't mention the mainland there. The important point here is that Clark has looked at um, many different forms indicating that it's a variable species. So many different forms of Consubrinus. He's determined that he has he can see no way of separating them through morphology. Um, so he's just determined them. He's just saying they're all the same species and refuting Diomediatus. If we go a bit further along to 1991, um, The Ants of Southern Australia, A Guide to the Bassian Fauna by Alan Anderson. So the Bassian Fauna, he's referring to the route of the south east corner of Australia. Um, and this is a key to the ants of that southeast corner of Australia. And in here you can see the Consubrinus, fairly distinctive characteristic part. The first segment of Gaster is orange brown. The remainder of the gaster is dark or black. Um, and he does say that part of the first segment, if we look at this book, Archie MacArthur, the late Archie MacArthur, um, he worked at the South Australian Museum on Camponotus, um, Archie states in here, he doesn't say first segment, he just says the anterior part is an orange brown and the posterior part is, is, is darker. And he might have said that because in the Riverland, in, uh, where I live in South Australia, there's not that one, um, this, this queen here. Now you can see that she's got the anterior part as a light colour and the posterior is darker. So this is not in relation to just the first segment. This is clearly a different form. Um, of Consubrinus. It could even eventually be a different species, but at this point in time I consider it to be Consubrinus because all the other characters are the same as other Consubrinus and the only thing that's different really is the colour of the abdomen. The colour in ants is often not a very good thing to be going by, but when it comes to this distinct banding on the back that's that's seems to be a pretty solid character in Consubrinus as opposed to colour itself. Um, and then if we look at a worker, so there's a worker, you can see it's got the same colour pattern as the queen. The first segment is light in the interior and it's got this, this dark rear band. The second segment light in the interior, dark rear band. So this still fits Archie MacArthur's description of the anterior is light coloured and the posterior is dark. Um, but I wouldn't surprise me if this eventually becomes a different species because it is quite distinct to all the others that I've seen. But at this point in time as a best fit it makes sense to me that it would be considered 
Consobrinus, and that's all you can do. You can all you can do is a best fit. You you find an animal, and then you've got to go to the descriptions of the holotypes and try and match up your animal with those descriptions. Try to find the most recent revisions. Try to look even look at earlier revisions. If you don't know what it is, say you don't know what it is. It's not wise to just simply find an image on the net, yep, that's it, put a name on it and, and publish it online because it just it gets into the database uh, where people are searching and in that way animals are propagated around the place with, with the wrong names. But if you've done the work, you've put in the effort and you've come across a best fit, then, then name it such because ultimately it's up to each individual to determine themselves what animal they've got. It would be it would be silly to rely on the images of other people to identify your own animal. If, if it's really an important study you need to either identify yourself or have an expert identify it. Alright so I hope you learnt something. Thanks very much and I'll catch you next time. Cheers.